we are here in North Toronto, not far from the scene where 10 people were killed, 14 injured, and so many lives changed forever. But those scenes of chaos and confusion from yesterday are being replaced by grief and resilience. We will show you what it looked like at the vigil today. But first, let's tell you some of the latest developments. Earlier today, the suspected driver, Alec Manassian, appeared in court. He's been charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder and 13 counts of attempted murder with one more charge expected soon. Investigators say that his precise motive remains unclear, but police and Facebook have confirmed what we reported last night, that a cryptic message appeared on Manassian's Facebook profile before the attack. The coroner is not officially identifying any victims yet, but police said they were mainly women. We're starting to hear from their family and friends. And a vigil for the victims was held here tonight. Hundreds of people coming through to, to pay their respects to those who died and also those who are still in hospital. Praise God! Praise God! Our hearts go out to all the people who have uh, perished and their, their relatives and friends. I was just right here Saturday have been me so it meant a lot for me to be here tonight yeah, i told my son that in any weather situation we are going to uh, to be there tonight we mourn with everyone who's who've been affected by this the families the friends 24 people were killed or injured in the attack. That is actually one less than police originally thought. And we are starting to hear more about those victims, about the lives that were lost, and also the people who are still fighting in hospital. David Common has the latest on that angle of the story. The job of identifying the dead and injured is extraordinarily challenging. Young and old, Canadians and foreign visitors, but even without certainty, families have been told to prepare for terrible news. When I left the gym, I saw all the bodies. <laughs> Sorry, I saw the body on the road. Most of those killed were carrying identification. The Toronto Police but the coroner says that job. isn't enough, uh, especially when the damage to bodies is so extensive. Frankly, it takes time to get records and it takes time to meet families. And so that's not a resource issue. That's really, you need to uh, ensure that you're talking to the right person. You take the time to do that. What is known? Two South Korean citizens are among the dead, students studying in Canada. So too is a Jordanian man here to visit his son, Munir Habib Abdu Al Najjar. 80-year-old Dorothy Sewell was on the street, perhaps enjoying the lovely weather in her retirement. Grandson Elwood Delaney is now mourning her loss. It wasn't an accident, right? It would be easier to deal with if it was, you know, you know, nature cause or you know, a little accident. But to go out this way, this woman's best friend is among the victims. Anne Marie D'Amico was just outside her office when the young woman and volunteer was struck down and killed. In a statement, her family says it comforts us knowing that the world has had a chance to know her and that her message in life will survive her death. Altruism rather than anger and hatred. I went to school with her and her and I were very actively engaged together in many different student groups. Uh, she was uh, a star amongst uh, amongst. Uh, many different people and she really was uh, in so many different ways um, uh, uh, a beautiful human being. Others are grievously injured. Ryerson instructor Amir Kumarsi is in intensive care. Haider Firas was Kumarsi's student, but the two have remained close in the years since. Amazing man, really amazing man. And last contact I had with him was four days ago. Just four days? Four days ago, yeah. Among the injured are co-workers of the dead, elderly residents and others. As they arrived at trauma centers, nearly all at once, it was controlled chaos. It was, you know, unimaginable. You know, I'm, I've been here for 14 years, I've seen a lot, but it was definitely, um, you know, very traumatic. But at the same time, as a nurse, we're trained to do this. And I think we're just and David, there is a remarkable story of a man who had a very close call. Certainly, but he's also very lucky. 
Morgan McDougall is his name, and he felt something. He heard something, turned around, and got his body turned around just in time to see the van, got out of the way partly, but was struck at 50 kilometers an hour, thrown unconscious, a big gash across his head, picked up by paramedics, taken off to hospital. But not only has he survived, but compared to so many others, he is lightly wounded. He's been released from hospital, but Ian, tonight he is back there because some of his friends were not so lucky. And so let's talk about the people who remain in hospital. Obviously their conditions are private, they should be, uh, but we do know from Sunnybrook, one of the nearest trauma centers to here, that took about half of the patients, that all of those who are still there are in intensive care, Ian. All right, David, thank you very much. Thank you. Even before the vigil here was set up, this crash site had become a gathering place for so many in the community. And behind me, you can see notes and signs and flowers from people who are really trying to come to grips with what's happened in this community. I saw the carnage, I saw bodies on the streets, and I felt like somebody has to do something. Constantine Gulich was moved to start this memorial to honor the victims and support the community. People who are just walking by, but they, everybody needs a moment to heal, everybody needs their canvas to express uh, themselves. All day, people stop by to leave messages of love and grief. This road, I walk every day, you know, really every day we are just uh, doing, you know, but it's, uh, uh, but I just feel so terrible. This is my road every day to walk, and at time, like one o'clock, <laughs> I walk every day from Finchan, Yangan Finch to Yangan Shepherd. Yesterday I decided to go to the gym instead. People are in pain today, like, you, you know, you're going on the subway knowing that even though quietly we're not talking to each other, people are thinking about, you know, what happened. It's become a gathering place for community leaders, members of a nearby mosque coming to pray. Being a national community, it was important that we could be here uh, with our message, uh, which is the motto of our community, love for all and hatred for none. And politicians, Premier Kathleen Wynne, side by side with Mayor John Tory, laying flowers. It's very sobering and very somber. This place will forever be a scar on the, on the city of Toronto, but one of the things about all scars uh, is that they're part of the healing process. And the Premier saw firsthand how this attack has left some in the community shaken. As Wynne left, she met a student from Seneca College where the suspects studied. Right now, everybody's, the security is heightened, so you'll be okay. Is there somebody who can go with you? Wynne tried to comfort her, suggesting she contact the school, which is offering counselling. At the heart of the investigation tonight, the suspect. Alec Manassian said very little in court today. Our senior investigative correspondent, Diana Swain, has been digging into Manassian's life and has the latest on the suspect. It's been a day of trying to read his face. Is there something there from high school or more recently that suggested what Alec Manassian was going to do? His expression betrayed nothing today as he appeared in court. Wearing a white jumpsuit, hands cuffed behind his back, he answered the judge's brief questions in a clear, steady voice. The agonized expression was worn by a man seen weeping in the front row, believed to be Manassian's father. You we're crying in court, sir. Can you at least tell us what you're feeling right now, please? Punch it back, punch it back. A picture is emerging now of Manassian's last several months. He joined the Canadian forces last fall at this base in saint jean sur richelieu Quebec, but quit basic training after only 16 days. A senior Canadian forces official told CBC News Manassian was an average to below average recruit. He had problems with dress, deportment and group interactions in a military setting. He went back to Seneca College in Toronto to finish his computer studies. A fellow student who didn't want to be named described Manassian as smart, the pillar of the group, but also as so awkward. Just last Thursday, when Manassian finished his courses, he posted this message to some classmates on a chat group. Finally finished college. F you all and good riddance. 
And just yesterday, this, the Facebook message CBC News reported on last night. Facebook has confirmed it came from his profile page and they've shut it down. The accused is alleged to have posted a cryptic message on Facebook minutes before he began driving the rented van. That post begins with what may be a reference to his failed army experience, private recruit Manassian infantry, and then the incel rebellion has already begun. All hail the supreme gentleman, Elliot Roger. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. Roger killed six people in a rampage in California four years ago, posting this ranting video just before. He was angry about being rebuffed by women, making him a so-called incel or involuntary celibate. Maxime Fissette works for a center that tracks websites with extreme and violent views, including incel sites. They have this huge resentment towards society and women, mostly women, uh, because they feel that women are rejecting them, uh, even though they see themselves as nice, nice guys. And that's a feeling of injustice that can fuel radicalization. Is that what prompted Manassian to do what he did? It's something that we'll be looking into. And Diana joins us now. Uh, we have to assume, Diana, investigators will be looking at these so-called incel sites. Uh, what are they going to find there? Well, unfortunately, Ian, they will find there already that there are some people celebrating Manassian. Some we've seen have already changed their profile picture on those sites to his photo. So it's just another grotesque development in what's already been a horrible story, Ian. All right, Diana, thank you very much. Thank you. So while police investigate the motive, officers have also been gathering evidence along a very large crime scene. More than 10 major city blocks, this would have been the van's path as it plowed through Young Street. Police say it was seven minutes after the first call came in that the suspect was placed under arrest. The big, busy stretch of road reopening this evening. As the CBC's Renee Filipponi tells us, a crime scene of this size presents its own challenges for the investigation. It's an enormous scene. A two kilometer span of Young Street where 24 people were hit. Oh. Today, it was about doing a detailed search to collect every piece of evidence from the scene where each person was struck. Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders welcomed the extra help that was brought in to analyze the scene. We had to acquire the resources of specialized uh, traffic reconstruction uh, resources from other jurisdictions. I can tell you the GTA collectively uh, called to pitch in. When you look at the, the police tape, you know, so many intersections away, these are not small blocks, they're large city blocks. This retired Winnipeg police officer spent a decade doing crash investigations. A lot of this information is very short-lived. It, it doesn't stay there forever, and if you don't document it immediately or as soon as possible, uh, it's gone forever. Damian Turner says police will be trying to map out the exact path the driver took. In order to prove first-degree murder, they have to provide evidence to show the accused planned to hit people. I would imagine they're, they're looking for information or looking for evidence that would help uh, show that premeditated um, action on behalf of the driver, that maybe he swerved towards a pedestrian as opposed to just traveling straight down the road blindly hitting whatever was there. And despite a lot of talk about possible motive, police won't confirm anything at this point. All doors are open, everything will be explored. There's a lot more uh, um, video uh, evidence that has to come in. There are a lot more witnesses. By early evening, the investigation here is now wrapping up. The yellow police tape is coming down and the victim's bodies that laid on the sidewalk are now gone. But police say once they leave here, they still have weeks of work ahead. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. And part of that work will be speaking to the police officer who continues to get so much praise. Constable Ken Lamb confronted and arrested the suspect. It must have been a nerve-shattering moment. It could have ended in bloodshed, but of course it did not. Joanna Rimiliotis now on how that officer kept his cool. It must have seemed like an eternity or a flash, a takedown that lasted less than a minute by an officer hailed a hero. 
The horrific attack had already begun a few blocks away. Constable Ken Lam was alone on routine traffic duty when he got the call. And he was the only one there, his siren blaring, when the van crashed to a stop. What unfolded is extraordinary. Lam's gun is drawn, pointing at the van. He doesn't know what to expect. The driver points what appears to be a gun and yells something, but you can't hear it over the siren. In what experts call a strategic move, Lam calmly reaches into his vehicle to turn it off. If he thought there would have been a threat to his life, potentially, he wouldn't have taken his eyes off the suspect. He turns off the siren, both so the suspect can hear him, but also to try to de-escalate the situation, because inherently the siren is going to make that suspect nervous. But it doesn't calm him. The driver steps closer. He wants the officer to shoot. Lam doesn't fire. He's not only provoking him and, and doing that, but he's also saying to the officer, shoot me, shoot me. Mike McCormick is head of the Toronto Police Union. If at any point that he thought there was an escalation uh, in the person's behavior and that there was a threat, he had the entire justification to use his weapon. We can't tell from this angle, but Lam knows that's not a gun. He doesn't shoot, but steps back as the suspect comes closer. Then, sensing an opening, moves forward. The power dynamic suddenly shifts. The suspect collapses to his knees. Suddenly, it's over. When I was talking to him yesterday, he was saying, Mike, I'm just a cop. This is what we do. Like, what's the big deal? He's certainly humble, and officers are trained to de-escalate. But still. It is a focal point of our training piece. Um, uh, having said that, that particular situation yesterday, uh, the, uh, the way in which it went down was uh, nothing short of remarkable. Remarkable, because training can only go so far. Scott Giovanetti is a former police instructor. He used the least amount of force possible to end the incident, and I agree with the characterization that he was a hero. As for Lam, he is overwhelmed and taking some time off. As a key witness, he won't be speaking publicly for a while, but will no doubt always be known as the cop who didn't shoot. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. And a final point on this, Rosie, the fact that Constable Lamb did manage to arrest this suspect alive leaves open the possibility, at least, that the suspect will talk to police and answer that troubling question, what was on his mind? And he just impressed the heck out of us, so he's going to have to live with that, too. Ian, across the country, we've been seeing tributes pour in. Let's start here in Ottawa. The Prime Minister was asked about the investigation this morning. Justin Trudeau says that the attack does not represent a threat to Canada's national security. And he had this message for Canadians. We cannot, as Canadians, choose to live in fear uh, every single day as we go about our daily business. We need to focus on... Um, doing what we can and we must uh, to keep Canadians safe uh, while we stay true uh, to uh, the uh, freedoms and values that we all as Canadians uh, hold dear. You've likely heard similar words before from other leaders following similar attacks. They are attacks against what's known as soft targets, everyday places where people go about their everyday lives. The difficult job of protecting those spaces was on the agenda at the meeting of G7 security ministers in Toronto today. Katie Simpson has more now on the target. It didn't take long for the new normal to arrive. Concrete barriers are in place for now around Toronto's Union Station. It is one of the few ways to protect busy public spaces, which was discussed today by G7 national security ministers. I thank uh, our American friends uh, and all of you around the table for your offers of support. Ralph Goodale was hosting his counterparts for meetings in Toronto when the attack happened. CBC News has learned shortly after 1.30 p.m. on Monday, the heads of the RCMP, CSIS, Canadian Forces and the Privy Council Office were told to look for any files they may have on the suspect or what's called a full spectrum review. The information was used to see if Alec Manassian had any ties to terror groups or if this could be a part of a larger plot. The agencies quickly compared notes to realize he was not known to authorities and was not on any watch list. 
But today, Goodale suggested he may now be concerned about groups like Incel. They're obviously motivated by views and, uh, and uh, perverted per perspectives that, uh, uh, that put these folks in, a, in an odd category. Toronto police remain the lead investigators, which means the next big responsibility for the government is trying to reassure Canadians they are safe to go about their daily lives. The message is critical, since there is little officials can do to protect against attacks in public spaces. You cannot in life protect people against everything. Our job is to try to do the best we can. Police will decide if and when these barricades here at Union Station can be taken down. It too is part of the overall campaign to make people feel safer in public spaces. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Toronto. The crash yesterday certainly invoked terror on the street in Toronto, but officials have been reluctant to describe it as terrorism. So why are some attacks labeled terror and others are not? What took place yesterday is clearly linked to a terrorist ideology. In 2014, there was no question. Martin Couture-Rouleau turned his car into a weapon and killed a soldier in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. It was called an act of terror by a radicalized lone wolf inspired by ISIS. Not so for yesterday. A devastating crime, but no official or authority has labeled it terrorism. Part of the reason from the public safety minister. As far as the information would tell us to this point, there is no national security connection. In Canada, the definition of terrorism is clearly laid out in the criminal code as an act undertaken in whole or in part for a political, religious or ideological purpose, objective or cause that is intended to intimidate the public. And the key reason for defining an act as being a, one of terrorism or not has to do with motivation. In the failed Edmonton U-Haul attack last year and in the Quebec City mosque attack that killed six people, politicians labeled both attackers terrorists, yet no terrorism charge was laid. Usually they're not laid because of this element of motivation. I mean, you really have to hit a pretty high standard in court to be able to prove that the person's actions were rooted in this ideological motivation. And sometimes that word, terrorism, gets in the way. Take the Moncton shootings. Justin Bourke shot and killed three RCMP officers. Officials never called it terrorism, even though police did consider laying that charge. It's easier just to proceed with the fact that you have an obvious murder case and that the penalty for murder is as severe as the penalty for terrorism, so it really doesn't make much difference. Still, Justin Bourke is now one of the Canadians who has received the longest sentence in Canadian history, 75 years with no parole.